The Colony, Texas, History of a New Community, based on information gathered from the Video Oral History Project of the Colony Public Library. Produced by the Friends of the Colony Public Library, the City of the Colony, Texas, May 1985. Funding for this project was provided by a grant from the North Texas Library System in conjunction with the Texas State Library. Project director was Joan Sveinson. Historical consultant and director editor was Catherine Jago. The next voice is that of Dr. Lee Knox, professor in the Department of Geology and Geography at North Texas State University in Denton, Texas. Cole is a small community and a busy growing community located in the southeastern part of Denton County. Actually, it has grown from the region of old fields. This is about the way that it looked before it started in 1974. And there were a few old agricultural habitation buildings that were on the landscape that still could be seen at that time. But these have grown today until they've become a community of some 17,350 people living in some 6,036 households. The map that's here shows the location of the colony and its relationship to the areas next to it. You can see, of course, that it is located uh, north of the city of Dallas. It's located on State Highway 121, and access is gained into the city of Dallas via both I-35E and also Preston Road. The colony is a planned community. It's very unique in having been planned. It was planned by a builder. The builder is that of Fox and Jacobs. They're a Nevada corporation. They began the development here during the year of 1974. The colony plat number one was filed with the county courthouse of Denton County on the 16th of May and was described as being some 42.924 acres of the BBB and CRR Company survey. As the colony has grown, each plat was additionally added and filed through the county for permission for continued development until the colony itself was incorporated. The colony is made up of a series of homes. These are some of the earliest and first of the homes that were built. The colony has many things that are ideal. Among these, of course, is the fact that uh, Fox and Jacobs, the developer, actually moved into the area where they were looking for adequate lands upon which they could develop. They had been working in the Dallas area, but were limited to a few uh, lots at a time and were actually being squeezed out. And they felt that if they could borrow buy land, on a major scale, they could come in and put in all of the needed amenities. This would include, of course, fresh water, would include that of uh, sewage treatment, would include that of solid waste, would include that of electrical needs, would include the needs for transportation. So Fox and Jacobs actually is the developer of the colony. They did select the site. And they did follow through a complete engineering plan city. The colony itself, as we said, is uh, northwest of the intersection of State Highway 121 and Farm Market Road 423 in the southeastern part of Denton County. It's situated 12 miles to the north of Dallas and 6 miles to the east of Louisville. It's 4 miles to Carrollton and 16 miles to McKinney. And is only 18 miles to the Dallas Fort Worth Regional Airport. Uh, State Highway 21, 121 has access to Interstate 35 and Preston Road, both of which carry heavy traffic into the Dallas region. The site on which the colony has been developed is an area of rolling plains with shallow intermittent creeks. Elevations will vary from about 530 feet above sea level to 630 feet above sea level. It's located in what is called the Blackland Prairies of Texas. It's in a region of mild winters and hot summers, or as it is most often described, a humid subtropical climate. 
The annual precipitation is approximately 33 inches. The majority of this occurs during the spring and early summer months. This, of course, is followed by high temperatures and little precipitation during the late summer and into the fall. This distribution is one of the factors that is a disadvantage to some of the construction in the colony region. That is that with excessive precipitation, the lands begin to absorb the water into the black clays and swell. Then during the long, hot, dry summers, evaporation lost from moisture brings about the contraction of the soils, and this frequently, of course, brings about some of the breakage of foundations and rocks. The bedrock upon which the colony is located is that of the Eagle Ford Shale. This belongs to what is called the Upper Cretaceous. Soils that have formed here in place are those of the Brannion series. They're described as a deep clay soils on the upland, and they have formed in valleys or ancient terraces of the calcareous clay sediments. Overall, the slope will range from zero to about three percent. Today, the colony and the development encompasses some 4,000 acres of land. As we have said, this was bought by Fox and Jacobs in the early 1970s and been developed by tracks since the initial plat was filed in Denton County in 1974. The Texas Water Board granted a permit, a permit to the Colony Municipal District No. 1 of Benton County to produce and treat water for a planned community. Four water wells were drilled in the Trinity and Paluxy Sands and have been the primary source of water used thus far. The wells have a capability of some 4,100 million gallons per minute. The water meets the demands meets the standards of the Environmental Protection Agency, but is not without problems. There is a chloride concentration approaching some 300 parts per million, a concentration high enough to cause taste problems, and the water is also high in dissolved solids, primarily the sodium bicarbonates and sulfates. The system includes high service pumping facilities. Treatment and pumping capacity is approximately 10,000 10, gallons per minute, or 14.4 tenths million gallons per day. Water is stored in two elevated and one ground reservoir, and the distribution of the water to subdivisions of the development are in lines that are 8 inches or more in diameter. Future needs are to be met with the purchase, purchase of treated water from the city of Dallas. This water will be delivered in a 24-inch transmission line and will deliver a minimum of 7.1 million gallons per day. A, a district's existing wastewater collection system is comprised of sewer lines from 6 inches in diameter to 30 inches in diameter. The district has two major wastewater pumpage facilities capable of processing two and a half million gallons daily with additional facilities <coughs> being planned. There are or was more than 5,000 water and sewage connections existing in the colony in 1982. Preliminary planning and engineering development systems for the total project after considering location, topography, and geology were developed. Following the survey of the track, all services that are needed are installed. Water and sewage from the front of the dwellings, an underground electric service is that that is provided from the rear. Storm sewers are installed and then paving of the concrete streets and alleys complete the site before the homes are built. Your principal traffic arteries are those of North Colony and South Colony Boulevards. Each are a minimum of four lanes or 44 feet wide to six lanes or 72 feet wide. <coughs> Both have outlets to Farm Market 430 on the west of the development. And Page Drive is another of the four to six lane roads. Bisects the community from, the May, from north to south and has an outlet on State Highway 121. Neighborhood roads feeding into the major arteries are 27 feet wide. Fox and Jacobs developed each track by crews that specialized, such as there was a foundation crew, former, framer crews, deckers, roofers, bricklayers, 
plumbers, electricians, sheet rockers, and finishers. The houses are then sold to private individuals, and more than 100 different designs are found in the colony in three major price ranges. The recent economic conditions has brought about duplex construction as well as smaller lots and also uh, smaller homes. The initial projection was for a population of 56,000 persons living in some 11,250 dwellings. In conclusions, a planned development is unique having both positive and negative features. The most apparent observed are those that might be seen as the following. As these come up, of course, you can see the amenities that are here for the population as schools, recreation, park facilities, fire, city hall, all have been added as a part of the overall planned community as well as business sites. Within the area, there is still that of some open space, most of which is being rapidly closed. Probably the greatest single problem that the colony encounters today and even in the future is that of the continued uh, heavy traffic. The positive features of the planned community of Fox and Jacobs, like those of many others, are the following. All lands are surveyed and the total area is developed. The streets are planned to carry eventual maximum traffic loads within the colony. All utilities completely developed before homes are built. All roads, alleys, and sidewalks are of concrete. The total plot is developed, it is built, and it is sold before moving to the next track. The Municipal Utility District is planned for the future needs. Educational facilities are being developed as needed. Limited vacant space is found in the housing areas. There are existing green belts along easements and drainage channels. And there is that of the developed park and recreational facilities. Now, where positive aspects are those that are to be pointed out, the negative should also be noted. Within the Negative aspects, there are those of limited land for future expansion, limited water supply, which means a purchase is necessary. Islands of old settlements are non-conformable. Drainage problems do exist during heavy rainfall. There has been until recently a single developer, so there's been a lack of variety in competition of builders. This has been a region of low and middle class income families, primarily. It is, was initially conceived for single families, but now is evolving into duplex housing. Another of the major negative aspects is that of the absence of industry. There has also been limited shopping centers and competition. This is being overcome at the present time. There therefore is limited local employment. There's a limited tax base. There are major problems of transportation to surrounding areas. There is the absence of a metro telephone system. There is a sale of homes by individuals to companies to become rental properties. But overall, thus far, in a period of only 11 years, the positive features of the colony have been greater, far greater than those of the negative aspects. about what your knowledge is of the selection of the name, the colony, for this community. Well, of course, it goes back to the early settlement, the old Peters Colony that was established and the routing along the Preston Road. The early families that were brought in through the Peters uh, effort. But uh, actually, when they started making the establishment of the colony back in 1974, they found that Texas already had a small community called Colony. Uh -huh. So since they had a community called Colony, it was necessary then to attach the colony to make this a unique and special settlement. So that's the reason we're calling uh -huh. the colony out here instead of just <laughs> Colony Texas. But uh, 
that's just rather a unique name in itself, the colony. That's right. I don't think there's any other town in Texas that prefixes with the word the anyway. I, I don't know of any. <laughs> Can you tell us some more uh, generally about historical settlement prior to the Peters Colony? Was there any Indian activity in this area? You had Amerindians in this region, of course. The old Comanchean uh, overlapped through here, and there certainly were Indian trails across the area. I mm -hmm. think there were two primary east-west trails across most of Benton County that was used. And there again, a lot of the early uh, Anglo settlements used the earlier Indian trails. Mm -hmm. It was the openings, my goodness, uh, getting through the cross timbers without someone hacking away for you would be almost an impossibility. And certainly many of the uh, uh, later settlers, the Anglo settlers, used the routes that had been opened mm -hmm. as routes by the Indians. Our only is so unique uh, in that, again, uh, the streets in the colony are named the early people who settled here. And these, these have meaning, historical value, a part of the overall. Dave Fox is the former chairman of Fox and Jacobs. Tell us why you made the decision to develop the colony in the first place. Well, our company had been building in North Dallas since the mid-50s, early 50s. Basically, our track had been going out marshland, starting around in Walnut Hill, and on up to Royal and Forest and LBJ, and up to Carrollton, front of the ranch. And in the early, about 1970 or 71, undertook a very major project in uh, Carrollton. Uh, which was a part of our expansion to the north. At that time the sewer and water problems were coming in at the limited capacity, especially the sewer capacity in Carrollton. And there wasn't going to be an immediate solution to it. We uh, went up to uh, Louisville and built some homes. And we were then trying to find out where we could go until the sewer capacity was increased in the Carrollton. Very coincidentally, as a matter of fact, a realtor came to us and came to Ron Walton and said he had a piece of land that he'd like for us to look at that he didn't think it was ready for the one we ought to take a look at. He drove Ron up to Fort 121 and Fort 23. Ron then came back, and what it was, there was a, we all use the USGA maps that show drainage and show ownerships. And most of the people were using a set of maps that were either going out Preston Road or going out I 35. Nobody had really worked the territory between those two, and there was another set of maps that this realtor had started using. And so there really had not been much activity between Preston Road and And there was a lot of a lot of land in there that was good land to build on it relatively had some roll to it, free land. Uh, ex cotton pasture. And there was some money, there was a track of, I don't know, it was three or four hundred acres that was available. Uh, we took a look at it in terms of its general location, and it was a good location, it was in the path of about uh, 121, of course, went straight across the airport. It was actually quicker to get to the airport at that time on 121 than it would be from down at the Beltline area. Beltline, the, the airport was just coming into its into its own. But three or four hundred acres really wasn't enough to do anything with in terms of trying to create a new environment out that far. So we suggested to him that perhaps if he could do a trustee arrangement could block up a significant track of land that we might have some interest in. Over a period of six or eight months, uh, he was able to block up some land. It was a 2,000 acres, I guess. Maybe it wasn't quite that much. But it was done as a trustee, not 
could be a fine. No, he was, he was the purchaser. Oh, it's this one. He worked for, uh, worked for Hank Dickerson and the name is Dickerson right now. But he did a, uh, he did an excellent job. That's what he And it was our concept that if we could get enough land together, we could then afford to, the lead time was necessary and the front end money was necessary to get some basic utilities in there. Mm -hmm. uh, and we felt like it was going to take somewhere from 1,500 to 2,000 acres we could form a municipal utility district, which is referred to as mm -hmm. That's done in many parts of the country, in many parts of Texas. Uh, it allows the owners of the land to create this district and to, uh, and agree to tax the land uh, to put in the necessary water and sewer. Uh, and uh, that's essentially what happened. We, we felt that it was in the right basic location. It was not contiguous with development. We realized that problem. So we felt with the, that there wasn't availabilities in Carrollton, limited capabilities in Louisville. And, Price of land over on Preston Roadside. My name is Ron Walden, and uh, I reside at 70. As the colony project specifically, and we need to know from you just where you were with the Fox and Jacobs Company at that point, and how you became involved with the project to start with. Okay, I am. Um, spent about a year in new home sales uh, with the company and was fortunate enough at that time to be interviewed by Mr. Fox himself uh, for a job uh, as what they call land acquisition manager at that time. Up until that time, uh, for the first 20 odd years of the company's history, Mr. Fox had done uh, primarily all of the land uh, search and negotiation and acquisition in planning and, and uh, follow through himself. And the company had grown to such a point in 1972 that he needed uh, to diversify and have someone else take some of that responsibility. And I was fortunate enough to get that position. Um, so I had about a year's experience in that area of the business when uh, the decision was made to search for what was to become the colony. Did your role change within the company throughout the existence of the colony project? Uh, I guess it would be accurate to say that the colony, and, the colony and I sort of grew up together in the land business because I was I was still uh, uh, green myself in the business, having only been in it about a year when uh, the company had a need to replace the land that it had in Carrollton at that time, which is uh, today still known as the Woodlake Subdivision. And uh, I remember quite well that Mr. Fox uh, directed me to start the search process in the area around Woodlake, which would have been North Carrollton. And it just expanded out in concentric circles until we came to an area where we could find land that was, that met the company guidelines, which were uh, land that was easily accessible uh, with access to jobs and schools uh, in what was considered a desirable school district uh, with uh, the opportunity from some place or another to, uh, to get water and sewer service, uh, land that would be suitable for the building of single family residential homes so it couldn't be too rough. Uh, and last but certainly not least, land in a price range where we'd be able to go ahead and build middle income housing. And that's really where the colony began is uh, uh, during that search process to replace Woodlake as, uh, as fate would have it, I suppose, uh, back in the 1972, late 72, early 73 time frame. There was a lot of syndicated investing in real estate and speculation around the new Woodlake subdivision had tripled the land prices within two years of the time that Mr. Fox had bought uh, what was to become Woodlake subdivision. 
one of the reasons the prices had increased so dramatically was because uh, of the tremendous success of the subdivision. The company had hoped to sell, oh, maybe 50 homes a month. And uh, by early 1973, they were selling three times that number. So there was recognized a tremendous demand in, in what the company thought of as the Northwest Dallas market corridor for single-family detached homes in the, in the uh, you know, medium price range. So obviously uh, it became apparent that the company was going to run out of lots um, much sooner than anticipated and would really need some new inventory as early as 1974. So as I say, we began the search moving out in concentric circles, and we looked as far west as uh, Flower Mound, and we looked as far east as uh, the western perimeter of Plano, and we looked as far north as Frisco, and obviously our southern boundary was Wood Lake itself. And what we found um, that eventually became the, the colony was a large, uh, um, it was actually a multi-ownership parcel of land there at the uh, uh, or north of the intersection of uh, existing farm market 423 and state highway 121 where uh, speculation had been pretty much kept in check because there was no existing supply source for water and sewer utilities so that's where we began the project Okay, let's talk a little bit about that land acquisition process. Did you encounter many difficulties in putting that whole package of land together? Uh, were there any significant holdouts that you hoped would come along but were having problems with? We um, actually started the, the search process um, about October of 1972, as I recall, and we were fortunate in that we were um, able to locate uh, a gentleman who was a broker in the area uh, where the colony is located now who had done business with most of the landowners who lived there uh, uh, previously. Uh, his name was James Hetherington and with James's help we were able to put together a game plan to amass uh, a a piece of land of a thousand acres or more and we had a critical mass that we had to achieve because we knew we were going to have to put in a new water and sewer utility system uh, because the Carrollton system was too far to the south and the Frisco system was too far to the uh, northeast and Louisville was on the other side of the lake. You just can't put in a municipal utility district um, or at least you couldn't in, in uh, those days uh, for less than a hundred a thousand acres of developable land. So we knew we had a critical mass to achieve and we also knew that with some speculation already going on in the marketplace if anyone discovered that we were making a large acquisition in the area uh, that it would probably defeat the project. So we were able to use James Hetherington as a, uh, in a trustee relationship and he went out and just quietly called on the individual landowners and put together uh, in early 1973 uh, what finally amounted to over 3,000 acres of land. Um, I don't recall that there was any single piece um, where there was a um, insurmountable holdout or anything really that protracted. The obviously when you acquire and my memory is there were over 30 parcels involved so in the, a large number of them and, and, and some degree of the success of the acquisition pro part of the process was due to the fact that the heirs of the Griffin family who had originally settled in that area uh, still owned many of the key pieces of property and uh, they were uh, uh, for the most part retired farm people and so they were they were willing sellers uh, it did take some months, as my memory is, that we closed on the first piece of land in about April of 1973, and the closings carried on, and we closed some parcels as late as, as into 1974. Uh, but um, I would say that the, the most interesting uh, and protracted negotiation uh, and acquisition process took place on the uh, parcel which... Um, uh, Mr. H.R. Bright 
owned at that time. Uh, everybody uh, that knows him calls him Bum Bright. And, uh, of course, he's built quite a, a well-known empire, including owning the Dallas Cowboys now. But uh, he owned 131 acres. That was the uh, northeast corner of 423 and 121. And it took us um, over two years to get him to agree to sell up his property. And as a matter of fact, when he did, what he wanted to do was trade for it. Uh, so we actually acquired uh, the southwest corner of um, Old Denton Road and 121, which also fit into the large farm that he owns just south of 121, in order to trade it to him for the 131 acres. And he is a, you know, he is a, a not only an interesting uh, gentleman, but one of the hardest dealing land traders that that uh, I'd ever dealt with because my memory is we gave him an equal sized piece of property for his property plus a million and a half dollars so uh, that that uh, easily was the most interesting and, and probably the toughest negotiation out of the whole acquisition Mr. Harry Hunsaker one of the first board members of the Colony Municipal Utility District. came to me in the form of an invitation by Dave Fox, then chairman of the board of Fox and Jacobs, Inc., to serve on his newly formed Municipal Utility District in 1974 when he was getting ready to start the colony. At that time, state law provides that anyone could serve on a utility district who had a piece of property within the confines of the district. There were no Real experienced utility districts up here. So he went to Houston, hired a law firm down there, and started one up here, and asked five of his friends to serve on the initial board. Thereafter, we were voted upon by the residents of the college. So your original, you were appointed to the original board by Dave Fox? That's right. <laughs> All you had to do at that time to get started, because if you were a mem member, there was nobody living out there in the colony area in 1974. I think there might have been two people living out there in mobile homes, but I don't believe there were really any people out there. And uh, all the law required was that you own property to be able to be a member of the utility district. And I own a little bit of land out there, so I qualified. And in 1975 or 6, they started electing people. I remember the first time we had an election, I won two votes to one. <laughs> it wasn't a very complicated election. I served in 1977, and I was defeated for re-election. I landed in 79, served until 83. Did you feel that as an outsider, since you didn't live in the colony at the time, that you might have been triggered by other people? Not initially, not at all, but later on it became an issue. As I ran in 1979 and 81, it became an issue. Um, and that's one of the reasons I decided not to run again in 1983. There was so much dirt and mud thrown about because I didn't live there. It didn't seem worth it to me. Also, it took a lot of time. And the issues became more and more complex. As far as I'm concerned, the common utility district has served its principal purpose. It has the best sewer system in that area of the county. And we have water from Dallas, so that we are assured of good water for a long time and enough sewer capacity to handle the town of 45 to 50,000 people plus the industry. That is what the purpose of this was. The initial decisions you made on the utility district were not momentous decisions. You were guided by engineers, lawyers, people of that type. As long as you do the poor judgment, go against their advice, there wasn't really much to do there. You could make decisions for the time, really, the color you're going to make the water tell and things like that. What were some of the major difficulties that you encountered in, in the basic development, the beginning development? Well, the uh, first basic difficulty was the question of, this whole question of jurisdiction, whether we could form a body. In the city's jurisdiction, the city limits of the city, you had to get permission from that city. And Frisco took a very strong position that we could not form it without their permission. They didn't want us to form it. They wanted 
that was a that was a very very difficult period. In How did you overcome that obstacle? Well, we finally had to convince them that they really didn't have it, and if they wanted to go to court over it, then they didn't have enough to other claims that they had. Mm -hmm. uh, that process is still going on, going to process too. Uh, but that was a very difficult piece of business. Mm -hmm. uh, telephone situation is a very awkward and difficult piece of business. And it's still, still is to not tell you it's all, but you know there's litigation still in place on that. One of these days in the service. The, uh, the whole question of marketing with people move out there. Mm -hmm. We really never had any problems in our minds that uh, it was a proper location, the prices would be well, would be good because the prices would be, could be served, served by sewer line. The land prices are estimated, so not, that we could come in there with $25,000, $50,000 pleasure. Uh, and it was in the, I say, in the path of that building. That is not the of the most concern, the of the most concern of this people get it on stream. And then the instant you know, thing about how how that would all come together and what city services, normal city services would be missed first, mm -hmm. how you resolve them. then you know, build us a spec fire station before the volunteer fire department was this morning. They weren't sure whether they were going to form one or not. They just thought that they probably would. So we built the station and they didn't. Did that worked out well. And I think it was a very effective fire department. It was a very fun period of time. People were very active, very used to the community. They took tremendous interest in it. They did a lot of pride in it. Still do. It's really fun to watch these people come together and work on these problems that. Uh, Normal folks did not have that opportunity. What were some of the high points early on? Oh, I don't know. Those Fourth of July uh, celebrations early on, the opening of the fire station, the formation of the homeowners association, the community meetings that we had up there in the evenings. Seeing those people, which were they were, you know, it sounded like cliche, but kind of they were pioneering. They were pioneering, in, mm -hmm. not just that they were. In, New district, they were in the area you live in, they were pioneering in a process. How do you form, how do you bring people together and uh, form a government and become a self governing body? And, uh, to see that take place was, uh, was a fascinating, fascinating place. What were some of the particular issues that you remember that in question that made an on them? Well, again, the, the whole question of what was important to them. I mean, there are some people that didn't want to incorporate things like the way it was. But as needs became aware, and obviously the whole issue of the security became an issue, the police issue, and the question, as I said, the stray dogs, which was kind of a peripheral thing, but that brought a lot of people together and said, hey, we've got to form something that we control this. Question of the street. You know, one thing to have the streets there, but occasionally you got to get them swept. And it was Much of the construction activity was caused the dirty streets, so we took care of those streets for a long period of time. But as the blocks became mature and it was no longer our part of the deal line, they had to figure out some way that they could form some kind of an organization. They didn't have to form the city at that time. They could have waited, or they could have gone with the other cities. They could have just been in the But as they grew, uh, then they became almost a threat to the other cities because they didn't think they could be in the But that, I think just the, the interpersonal sort of things that were going on between us, those people, and us, and between them, obviously, there was. Some people had more interest in the development than others did, and others had dramatic interest in it, and had disagreements. They had to work out their disagreements. Again, that process was a process. 
Do you feel that uh, the final decision to incorporate rather than to join with another one of the cities, do you feel that was the right decision for them to have that made? Oh, I gotta tell you now, we had our fingers crossed all along with that's what they do. We just felt that that would be in the best interest. Their, their issues that they were going to be facing and their problems that they was unique to them. It would be very hard for some of the other cities to be able to uh, service them. Well, Fox and Jacobs really was the governing body for quite a long time. Uh, you've mentioned some of the things that went on. Is there anything else that comes to mind that was a problem as being the only government structure other than the mud that existed? Well, there was a, it was a, there was always a, a conversation of did, did they really want us to control it or didn't they want us to control it? And, uh, if we we're going to control it, if we we're going to supply the money to do everything, we want to say how it's going to be done. And that isn't right. And it should be that the people have to control it. But then if they do that, then they got to tax themselves and spend the money. So that transition period is just like a child growing up and into their teenage years. That transition, was, in some days, was very awkward. Uh, but it, it was all done in good faith. It, it, Leadership at that time in the community were, were so interested in what they were doing, and they took a lot of flack from a lot of good, a lot of good neighbors. Uh, and they may have made mistakes. Second guessing, I don't know that they made any good second guessing sales. That process and the fact that they took a leadership and they took the responsibility to, to move forward, and yes, they had to negotiate with us on a lot of issues. When we stopped street. What were we going to do? What were they going to do about? They had no money. What were they going to do about parks, setting park sites aside, and what kind of money we did donate to the parks? The question in the fire department how much support would we give them for how long? Where would we set the property aside for a library? That negotiation. That whole question of, of the developer city relationship, it was a constant sort of a thing, and that, that's still there, and it's very healthy. And the fact that those people were able to, to come together and elect leadership, and the fact that there was enough interest in the high turnout in the elections, the early elections had a very high turnout. And it shows that those folks just love what they're doing. Love the community. When they did finally incorporate, how did you feel? It was in a sense of relief that they didn't carry that particular burden anymore, or was there a little bit of sadness in a way? What, what was your feeling when they, oh, we felt suddenly that. they were independent? Yeah. Well, they had formed a city and they had their charter and they had to play, but they had no money. I mean, they were, it was still just another step in the process. Uh, and it was, again, a great process. It was something that we'd look forward to when that day would come, but they would form it. But even then, they they still were, you know, we still were partners as we are today. And, uh, so it was a, a, a graduation, you know, from junior high school to high school. They still weren't out of school yet. Uh, and uh, the support was still needed, and my cooperation was you know, still needed. Uh, but, uh, no, we thought it was a great day. We were very pleased about it. But they weren't going to be totally independent because they still had no funds. Mm -hmm. it would be, at least they have a structure in place that they can start to get the future. You have talked a little bit about the concept of the colony as a frontier community. Um, are there any other characteristics of what one would consider a frontier pioneer community of the late 19th century that could be put in, compared with the late 20th century as far as this particular community is concerned? Well, I don't know how people sort themselves out. You know, why did people buy there when they could have bought in Darwin? I always said that the cream goes to the top and the cream came to the colony and the people that had self confidence, uh, which would relate to the early pioneers that they had confidence in themselves and had confidence in what they did. So they knew, in my opinion, they were great people. They were able to 
get themselves together, get their families together. Move to the colony. And there wasn't anything there. Really take that risk. And those people that have self confidence, people that do rise, and they, they, they people. It's a self screening process. How did you choose the name of the colony? Well, I'm sure you, you, you need to get a good feel of that history. I, I, I'm sorry, I kind of forgot some of the particulars of it. Of course, it comes from the Peter's colony, which was how um, this part of Texas was all colonized in England. And encouraged, people, encouraged people to move from England to the United States, but it didn't attract some land. That is, entrepreneurs. Yes, was able to make a deal with the state and then go over and get people to sell it. Vacant land that nobody's doing anything on has no value. The only way the state create value is to get people to do something on it. They had the ability to really entice them. How did you get the name of the colony? They were using some territorial battles at that time. So called war up there had head cut. Actually, I'm standing. Mr. Roosevelt Johnson, early resident of the colony and a member of the City Charter Commission. Pioneer of natural, most of the people out here are pioneer kinds of people. And, and it was that pioneer kind of thing. It's something that, that just sparks in you. Uh, it, it, it allows involvement, period. You could say that the people here are pioneer kinds of people. What, how would you define a pioneer kind of person? They're individual. They have their own unique way of thinking. They're not afraid to voice their opinions. They have within them the art of compromise, and they understand the art of compromise to get things done. But they are their own people, too. And, and if you look at it, no one here is, is well from different parts of the country. But we, we, we came together as a group, and we still do, and we respect each other. Uh, these people here have such a wealth of information. Mr. Bill Longo, early resident of the colony and former mayor. What prompted you to choose the colony as a place to live? Well, back in 1974, when I was stationed at LaGuardia Airport for American Airlines, the job pressure started to get to me. And I had to make a decision whether to find a new job or a new city. And since Dallas Fort Worth Regional Airport was coming down the line, I decided to come on down to Texas and check it out. I've been to Texas before, but mainly along the Gulf Coast, such as Beaumont, Port Arthur, Galveston, Houston. So I had an idea what Texas was. I flew here into Dallas in 74. I spent two days driving around the Metroplex area, and I fell in love with the northern part of Dallas. And when I purchased my home here in the colony, there was really no models. It was nothing. And I signed the contract not even knowing the price of the home. And my wife almost killed me for that when I flew on back to New York. Said I bought a house, but I don't know how much I paid for it. And about two months after uh, the colony was officially opened, the salesman sent me a new contract and told me what it was going to cost me purchase the house. And it wasn't as bad as I thought it was, but I mean, that's really a heck of a way to buy a house, sign a contract, not even know what the price of the house was. So you were literally one of the first people in the colony. I believe I was. I believe I bought the first house, but I was not the first family to move in here. I moved in. My family moved in uh, about eight months after the first family started to come in the colony. Well, share with us how many years you've been in the colony. Well, my family came here in March of 75, and I came down here at the end of 75, so I've been here about almost 10 years now.
You've been involved significantly in the development of the colony almost from the very first. From what you just told us, it was from the very first. What factors made you decide to become so extensively involved? When the first people bought the house in the colony, they were somewhat sold a bill of goods by the salesman for Fox and Jacobs. You were told that uh, you were living, you were buying into a community that had wonderful telephone service, Southwestern Bell. Your children were going to a school which had a very good reputation, Louisville Independent School District, and the police protection was being handled by the Denton Sheriff's Office. And also there was a fire station with the equipment there, so you had some wonderful fire protection. And you really didn't realize what was happening to you as a homeowner until you moved in the colony and you found out that all the calls out of the colony were long distance. If you had a problem, you needed a police protection or a police officer, and you called the sheriff's department. It took them anywhere from 45 minutes to two weeks to show up. And if you put your school, your school child on the bus in the morning, nine out of ten of them had to stand up all the way to Louisville. And then also the fire department, and when I say the fire department, I'm talking about the first fire station, which we know as the barn. The trucks were there. There were four helmets, four bunker coats, and uh, four pair of boots, but no firemen that were trained because the fire protection was coming from Frisco at that time. They had made an arrangement with Fox and Jacobs that they would supply fire protection to the colony. The Homeowners Association realizing that we needed fire protection, their first project was really to get the volunteer fire department in operation and we had to raise money for equipment. And we also had to have the people trained. And they were trained by the Frisco Fire Department. But it was up to the colony homeowners to find the money for the insurance, gasoline, and more equipment, such as bunker coats, helmets, and uh, boots. And I got involved in, in the fire department mainly as a fundraiser. And it was a wonderful thing. There was approximately 150 families in the area at that time, and they used to turn out to the Homeowners Association, and we'd throw picnics and garage sales, and we did raise the money to, for the fire department to become operational in a very short time. When I was in the Homeowners Association, I was chairman of the Law Enforcement Committee, and the function of the, of the Law Enforcement Committee was to try and improve uh, the response time of the Denton Sheriff's Office to the colony citizens. And at times used to appear before the county commissioners and try to uh, influence them and putting some pressure on the Sheriff's Department to send patrols here in the colony and also to uh, speed up their response time when the colony citizen requested a police officer. And to a certain degree it, it helped. Uh, I believe the commissioners felt there was a large voting block here in the colony, and they sort of catered to us slightly. The sheriff at that time, I believe his name was uh, Wiley Barnes, he did request his patrol officer to come down here uh, more frequently than it was before, as far as the sheriff making a patrol through here. So law enforcement did pick up slightly. So you did start to get better response time then? Yes. Um, what were some of the other major concerns of the Homeowners Association? The residents that belong to the Homeowners Association, their major concerns, believe it or not, was animal control and police protection. Those were really the two major items. They wanted better police protection because most of the people that lived in the colony uh, their husbands were transit, so to speak. They were in sales or in the airline industry, so the husbands were out of the city, and the wives were alone here, and their main fear was crime. And they wanted to have uh, a decent police protection. And the other problem was with animal control. We had dogs, cats, squirrels, skunks, rabbits, cows, 
running all over the colony. And they did create a problem here. So whenever you went to a homeowners association meeting, and most of the people that attended out of uh, 150 families, we used to draw or attract a crowd of maybe from 50 to 100. And you would always hear the same complaint. There's something no matter with the sheriff's department or the cats and the dogs are, are getting out of hand. And once in a while, some people would complain about the lack of trees, but mainly it was the police protection and the animal problem. 77, when the homeowners decided to investigate the feasibility of becoming a city, I was a member of the committee to study the facts of whether we should incorporate or not, and that committee consists of 10 people. Clockwise from the center of the screen, Mr. Cliff Orm, Mr. Norman Adeller, Mr. Bob Halk, Mr. Robert Brown, and Mr. Chris Fabian, all members of the City Charter Commission of the College. And work. Uh, if we could talk a little bit about the decision to incorporate to start with. And why did that take place? What were some of the options? What was the opposition? What was there opposition? Who wants to respond to that? This this is open forum now. Anybody jump in? Uh, I can remember looking back, uh, moving out here. It was it was still loose, and part of the the discussion through the rumor mill was we would either become part of Louisville, okay, but we are separated. We're technically separated from Louisville by water and miles. And then the second one was the thinking when they decided to form the city was you guys out there, maybe Dave Fox, you guys will either become part of Frisco, part of Hebron, and I still can't find the kind of seat of that, or part of Frisco, I mean, or, of Louisville. But when you looked at, look at these Yankees moving in here, and look Whoa. at the brass, brass. <laughs> <laughs> He's standing on my side of the table. <laughs> but look at the broad dichotomy of people oh, moving so in. You know, there was really no, nothing to glue us to any of these areas. Frisco and Little Elm and Eastvale hadn't grown in a thousand years. And didn't want to. And, and, and didn't, didn't want us. They didn't, they didn't want to be involved because they knew how this exactly. was going to grow and that we would be the, they'd be the tail of it and we'd be the dog if we. Uh, and that was, sure we that was part of the, the discussion. And then when you go into uh, Kroger in Louisville, the people that were there would go, who are you? You know, they were going through a cultural shop. You they remember were. that? Sure. You know, who are all these people? Like, you, know, you speak. They almost asked you for a visa when you come. That's right. Okay. Well, the colony is still a Yankee city. There are very few native Texans. Look, I, on my whole street, we don't have a we don't have a uh, Texan on the street. We have three. So we they they three. formed. Yeah, like, two of them are married. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it's it's very unusual that this is a Yankee city. Almost everybody in here has been uh, brought in. A transplanted person. And like Bob was saying, Republicans. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but we should predominantly was in there because not all. But yes. what Bob was saying is true. That we had formed uh, study committees had been formed to look at these specific issues of where we wanted to go, and and the consensus was we didn't want to join anyone. And uh, we'll get maybe get into the phone system thing later, but uh, it was like we were alone out here. Mm -hmm. You really felt that sense of isolation, all of you? Yes, for yeah. the, for the, in the beginning. Mm -hmm. There was a, a very strong feeling of isolation. I think probably the most accurate description of the situation and, and its future was done in a, a letter to the editor by Mayor then Mayor Backus in Frisco, first house. I bought two houses in the column. When I bought the first one, it was very nearly a year before it was to sell to move in. And that was the peak building period for Fox and Jacobs. During that period, uh, the incorporation occurred. And that was led from a subcommittee out of the home of the old homeowners oh, association. Home. Mm -hmm. uh, Judy McConnell and Linda Adams and there were some other folks. Linda David Dahl. 
Name of God. Oh, there's a name out of the past. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, quiet memories. <laughs> <laughs> early. Yeah, yeah. Um, Linda Adams served on the wrote the incorporation or signed the incorporation, and she happened to be expecting at the time. And Fox and Jacobs had severe concerns that she was going to be in the hospital delivering her son at the time. They needed signatures on the documents, and that was a major worry. Mayor uh, Bacchus stated that there were agreements by Fox and Jacobs that they had not lived up to. And he says, you don't want the colony to happen because it will stymie everything that they were trying to do. And there became a very, very bitter feud between Mayor Bacchus and Linda uh, that transpired in the press. John, I recall. And then the incorporation occurred over what to name the city and uh, over the Baptist Church. In fact, the Baptist Church, after that, was that they goofed. <laughs> yeah, well, I liked Colony Park. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> it got so heated there that the church asked us to, asked really? the city to, to, to move the meetings because they didn't like the language. Mm. All right, any event, the colony got chosen simply because that happened to be the name of the development that Fox and Jacobs had on it, and they didn't want to spend the money. The city colors became brown because that was the colors that they had on all the signs. The um, city of the colony, by the way. <laughs> right, exactly. A colony, Texas, outside of Houston. Mm -hmm. Then that was why colony never came about. The second choice was Colony Park. Much less. Okay, let's move on from that. The city was incorporated, as we know. What happened next? What? was the prompt to decide to develop this charter and develop the government in that direction. There was a committee formed first to determine whether or not we would go home rule. Mm -hmm. okay. Can you explain what home rule means? Can one of you explain what the well, okay. You live by uh, Vernon's and the Vedic statutes mm -hmm. when you're um, incorporated. And you go home rule. You now have your own charter. It gives you more more rights. You can go out and you can involuntary annex land into the city. You can increase your tax base over 25 cents. You have uh, your charter that you live by. You're still governed by some of the and statutes, but your charter is what you live by. And you can either add to it or subtract to it every two years. Every, every two every years. years. Our, our capabilities were basically well, limited. To a great extent. And the alternative was a general law city. Yeah, that's well, correct. That's, yeah. that, well, that, that's, that's essentially right. what we were, we were in that particular law. time. We were a general law. We could stay general the, law or we could go home. The, the, the initial reason, I think, for getting into it, I think the intention was from the beginning to get into a home rule situation. But there was a requirement, there was a requirement, and uh, several requirements, and one of those being uh, the number of people or number of residents in the city, I believe, was 5,000. When we hit that 5,000, we, 5, we were ready to roll. Okay. Yeah. That's when we what, were born. What date was this, approximately? May 15, 1978 was the meeting. Mm -hmm. The study committee. First yeah, study the study committee. committee. That was the first study committee. The study committee was appointed by? Council. 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 Uh, that was that, appointed. That, I believe it was just volunteers. Uh, box, uh, no, yeah, yeah, right now it was volunteers, but the council, I think, ratified those yeah. people. Yeah, because there, there was, there was no election. No election no for that. There was, there was no just a study, and there were quite a few people. There was a lot of meetings. Yeah. Sometimes we had 30. Mm -hmm. What did, essentially did the study committee do? Can they teach? determine whether or not we were going to go? Home rule general. It general. was a step that had to be taken prior okay. to getting the home rule charter election. Okay. And the council needed verification from an, a Six. citizen body that mm -hmm. said this is something that ought to be reviewed. Okay. Were any of you on that committee? Were all of you on that committee? I was, I was on. I think you were Bob. Yes. Bob Brown, Bob Fox, the 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 Norman Adela. Okay. The other three of you. I, was, I almost you forgot about that study no. commission. No, there's the yeah. Norman, Norman first. Week. Norman, myself, and Bob Howe were on there. Okay. Okay. Linda Dowdy, who so, was on the tour commission. The study committee then 
made the recommendation to the city council that we go home rule. And that goes home back to have the election. Uh -huh. yeah. And for a home rule to home rule. But that goes back then again to that pioneer thing because here you, you can still see the workings of, of felt like Dodge City. Uh, of that individualism coming out again. And, and this gave us rule and control of our own selves. But there was an underlying back reason behind that. And it had to do with the government and taking over the, f it was purely financial. Mm -hmm. Because they were not, Fox and Jacobs was building the streets and having to fund that out of their own pocket. And it ultimately came down. They were, they were pushing oh, for a corporation mm -hmm. and for home rule. Yeah, happened very That's strong. Sure. Into anything other than them, them having to build everything themselves. Ms. Janice Carroll, first city secretary of the colony, Texas, and now city manager of the colony. Okay, I want to talk for a minute about the decision to incorporate. Mm -hmm. And um, I'll would like you to, to tell me why you think that the community voted to incorporate and what the other options were that were available and why those were not selected. Okay, to the best of my knowledge, and which as I said, I wasn't involved in those inner workings of the incorporation committee, but uh, obviously they wanted better services. It's just been a continuing fact that the people that moved out here come from cities, they want more services, and we can't provide them. And we're slowly catching up with that. But uh, in those days, I think the primary reason was for police protection and animal control. And they wanted those services. Now the option, I think, other than incorporating and levying a tax and making it more expensive to live out here was to stay rural and Fox and Jacobs, I think, very much wanted us to at the time. And maybe they realized also that it, it would be a hard thing to do mm -hmm. to set up a city with that small amount of uh, homes or a small tax base. But I think people wanted just immediate needs met. And that was one of the primary reasons. What about uh, joining another community that was already in existence? Well, I don't think that really was ever an option because the spirit of the colony from day one has been very strong that we are an independent community. And I, as I said, you know, I wasn't a party to all of the, the meetings and the talks, mm -hmm. but um, I don't think that was really a, a very valid option because people were very proud of our community and there was a pioneer spirit and I think they wanted to be uh, on their own. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, that leads into the next question I had, which is can you kind of characterize the residents mm -hmm. at that time and, and talk a little bit about this pioneer spirit and that, mm -hmm. that feeling that at least we've been hearing from others existed? Have you? Mm -hmm. Well, maybe it's because of the numbers and maybe it's because of our isolation that caused a, a lot of that. Mm -hmm. And I think another reason was because people came here from all over, and many of the people that moved here did not have any family close by. So we became the family. Mm -hmm. Now, we were a little bit different because on weekends we would go to Fort Worth or Waco to see our relatives. But uh, when you come from New York, you can't do that. So uh, I think those three factors caused people to look to one another for a little support. Plus, we wanted to get uh, activities going, and particularly for children. And you know the old adage, if you have a child, you'll meet everybody on the block. <laughs> because they get out, and they socialize, and they want to play, and they want activities. So people started drawing together to, to uh, do things to make, make this a, a good place for their children, as well as themselves. Many of the people did not have any relatives close by, so they just drew to one to another. Mm -hmm. And with that pioneer spirit and that unity, I think it even helped us in that we all had houses almost exactly alike. Uh, I think there was a real comradeship there, mm -hmm. and uh, and a need and a common need, and it, it was really a nice 
a nice spirit for a while. You know, if you ran out of sugar or butter and you were baking a cake, you had to borrow it from your neighbor because there wasn't any place to buy it. <laughs> so I think that kind of helping uh, create a really nice spirit in that week. Can you talk briefly about, uh, since people did seem to move here from so many different areas mm -hmm. and they brought different experiences mm -hmm. with them from those areas, what do you think, or how do you think those backgrounds have contributed or have been negative as far as the colony is concerned? If you'd asked me about five years ago, I would have said, oh, I think it's negative. <laughs> but now, I think it's positive. And uh, I know I've told a lot of people, I think what I've been privy to is seeing democracy in action and the colony has really evolved you know, of, for, and by the people. And without getting too mushy, I can almost relate it back to the colonists and people coming from, from across the sea, from different mm -hmm. places, and, and meeting together and having different uh, ideas and then developing a country. And we did that on a much smaller level here. And I think because, uh, people coming from different uh, areas of, of Texas and of the United States uh, really helped us because the the arguing that ensued from that and the different ideas that came from all of that uh, made us work out the hard way the very best type of government for us. And the uh, calling everything on the table, so to speak, and all of our, and I'm talking about from the political standpoint mm -hmm. particularly, and everyone speaking up and knowing they'll be heard because we're small. I think now, Eight years later, when I look back at all of the turmoil, has made us much stronger and made us a very upfront kind of government. Um, just a brief history. Uh, mm -hmm. Can you talk quickly about where the first city hall was located and a little bit about the, the chain in the actual physical site of city hall as a okay. place? The, uh, First city hall, well, I'll have to go back. Luis Guerrero kept some records at his house when we first mm -hmm. started. That was, he was elected in April of 77, mm -hmm. and then they hired me to go on full time mm -hmm. July 18th, I think, 1977. So he kept records at his home until then. Then we moved where the old, or the first stop and go is. Mm -hmm. I still call it the old stop and go. What is the intersection there? That is at South Colony in 423. And there was a, a little office next door to that stop and go that had originally been a doctor's office. Mm -hmm. So we all had uh, sinks in our office. <laughs> that was real handy. And uh, he moved out and we got that little office space. And it had a, a front waiting room. That's where we had the city council meetings. And the little... Uh, uh, office area with a sliding glass panel. That was our storage room. And then you went back a hallway into three little examining rooms <laughs> and uh, an office, the doctor had an office. Well, the mayor got the office and he had the carpet. And we all had the sinks and the linoleum floors painted white, real small. And that was the way we were set up. The, the uh, Police chief, which was Jim Beltran, he was hired in August. When I was hired, was uh, in one one little examining room, and then we had the little walkthrough with the place where I guess they kept all of their their uh, equipment mm -hmm. into my office, the city secretary's office, and then there was a third office that uh, later on I moved into it, and then the uh, police department got a uh, secretary, and she moved into this office. But we were all just right there together. We had one restroom in there, and we got a bookkeeper. And I remember, man, that was Jane. Now, Tony Marcioli did our books for a long time. He would take things home. He'd come by after work, pick up the bills to be paid, carry them home, and then bring them back on his way to work. Then when we hired Jane, we had to put her in there with me. So it was maybe a 10 by 10 office with two desks, a table, chairs, a file cabinet. How long were you in that facility? Oh, gee. We moved in in, in that July of 77. And I'm thinking in 78, and I absolutely can't remember the exact date, 
we moved um, we moved to the house, which is where Walmart is now on the other side of, of South Colony. Okay. So we stayed there. I I take that back. We stayed there over a year. Over a year there because uh, Tom Hart, our first mm -hmm. city administrator, we called him then, was died that following mm -hmm. in June of '78. I believe so. After he came on and stayed there for a while, we moved into the, the house, okay. which was much better facilities. Can you better just, then. Uh -huh. <laughs> I was going to say, can you quickly describe the house a little bit? Uh, tell us yeah. when it was, the general time frame that it was originally built. Oh, it was probably built in the 40s, mm -hmm. the house. It was really a beautiful house uh, back in the, the era of the knotty pine paneling, real wood paneling. It was really pretty. And it had been fixed up very nice in a frame house, commercial mm -hmm. wood. Had the stock pond. It was up on the hill, had the stock pond down below. We had a barn in back. We had a little field mice and stinging scorpions <laughs> and everything else in there too. I uh, had two bathrooms. So the girls got the bathroom back behind the kitchen by the uh, garage and the guys got the bathroom it had two doors, one off the hall and one into the city manager's office. So he had a, a semi-private bathroom off his, off his big office, which was the master bedroom. Then I had the, the little girl's bedroom on the other side. It was blue with white carpet and little uh, French shutters. It was real nice. <laughs> but then the secretaries had to be up there in the living room. So you had to you know, yell or hit the intercom to get a secretary back down the hallway where you were. So mm -hmm. uh, it was uh, the, the front living room area where we had the secretaries and we had council meetings, had a fireplace, and when the heat went out, we could literally just build a fire. Well, that was a help. We'd, yeah, we'd build fires to keep warm sometimes. Mm -hmm. When the heat went out, it had old, an old system mm -hmm. in there that we had to work on all the time. How long were you in the farmhouse? Okay, when we moved there, which I guess was the I think the latter part of 78. Mm -hmm. We stayed there till June of 80, because in June of 80 we moved over here. And here is? Here is on North Colony into this modular building that used to be, it's been two banks. We bought it from North Texas Bank in Louisville. It was their first bank. It used to be the old Valley View Bank. And uh, we moved it up, up here and did some work in it and we revamped it and mm -hmm. took out the lobby and made offices and took out the teller cages and made more offices and then it served as well. Mm -hmm. Very good. Mr. Tom Hart, first city administrator of the colony, Texas, and first city manager of the colony. Going from uh, working as an assistant in Denton and uh, also being uh, students at North Texas, how did you make the transition from there to the city of the colony? Oh, uh, that was an interesting transition. I, uh, I probably, like a lot of people, thought I was ready to tackle the world uh, back then, and uh, uh, it's taken me a few more years, really, in this profession to learn just how much I, I didn't know, but. But about 1978, I was really getting the urge to uh, to actually be a city manager. I had been an aide to one for two years and had, had been involved in all the processes and had some very good experience. Again, a couple of years in some departments and then two years in the manager's office. So, so I felt like I was ready to tackle it and uh, <clears throat> started looking at some cities that were coming open in the area. And I noticed a job advertisement for the Colony, Texas. And, uh, I think it was called Administrative Assistant to the Council. I don't even remember exactly what the title was right now, but I sent an application down. And I got a call back from a gentleman named Joel Larkin, who was at that time doing some consulting work for the Colony, Texas. Uh, Joel asked me to meet him for lunch. So I remember we met in Louisville, Texas at, uh, I believe it was the Ramada Inn for lunch. Oh, and this would have been 1978. We sat there, and I remember Joel trying to explain to me what the job was going to be, and, and I had never actually laid eyes on the colony. So, uh, you know, my my concept of a city was was basically the two cities I worked in: the city of Odessa, which is a city of hundred thousand, 
uh, had staff of you know probably 500 people, and uh, the city of Denton, which was a city of near 50,000, but it had its own electrical system, and you know it had a staff of near 500 people. So, so that was my concept of a city. Well, Joel tried to verbally tell me what the Colony Texas was like. He said it had just incorporated back, uh, I guess, in January. And this would have been, I guess, April or May that he and I were talking of 1976. So it had just incorporated. They had a council. Uh, they already had their share of problems that go with a, with a small city. Uh, the police department at about that time was going through a you know, pretty good uproar. Uh, uh, he said that I think the total of the employees were, I think there was a city secretary, there was an animal control officer, there was a receptionist, there was a police chief and two officers, but the chief had just left, so it was really just down to two officers. So that was the sum total of the staff at the Colony, Texas, which was uh, at that point a, t a city of, I guess, uh, 7,000 some odd population. Uh, the way he made it sound was, well, you know, it, it, it's not that much going on right now, but he, he basically said, Tom, you know, at this point in your career, it'd be a good opportunity for you to come down. It is going to develop into something. So when I left that luncheon, I thought, well, okay, it doesn't sound like it's really going to be much going on down there right now, but it, at least it, it would probably very quickly, you know, get me the title city manager, and I could, they're going to grow fast. I can stay with them. I say that for one reason, it, it was somewhat misleading. The day I walked into my first meeting or first morning of the Colony, Texas, I started and I didn't slow down for the three years I was there. Uh, the, the little uh, quiet atmosphere that he had described to me and not being much to do, uh, maybe it was that way until the day I got there, but the day I got there it was just, uh, as uh, the gentleman that was mayor at that point in time said, and I always remember the, uh, the expression that he used about the colony Texas. He says, it was, who was that that was mayor? The mayor was Bill Longo at that time. Okay. okay. And Bill had a favorite expression. He says, a colony is like laying tr track in front of a moving freight train. And I think that was a perfect expression. I mean, we were, we were out in front of a speeding train and trying to get the track laid for it to stay on. So I went down there and walked in there, and like I said, I probably thought I knew more than I did. But uh, I walked in the door, and it was an immediate learning experience. If I didn't know it, I had to learn it real quick. Uh, there weren't many staff at that time, as I said, but the one thing about it, that the few that were there were really good people. Uh, and Janice Carroll was the city secretary at that point in time. Of course, now she's city manager down there. Uh, and there was a lady named Liz Carruthers, I remember, who was a receptionist that, that uh, she had an accent that wouldn't quit, but she was just one of the nicest and beautiful people I've ever met. Uh, uh, you... <clears throat> As I think my, it was either my mother or dad said one time, she, they said, you know, you've worked there quite a while, doesn't she know your name yet? Because when she would answer the phone, it was Mr. Hart, you know, which was similar to Hart, but I mean, it was close, but beautiful people. And uh, Nick Restagno was the acting police chief when I got down there. Nick uh, had about six months of total police experience at that point in time, so uh, not exactly what you call a long tenured police officer or chief, but was doing a superior job. I mean, for the lack of experience he had, he was just doing an excellent job. So, I've got to say, there weren't many people, but they were good people that were there. Again, you've got to understand the background I had walked out of. Uh, the cities I had left, uh, they were full-service cities. Uh, if I needed an attorney, I could walk down the hall and we had in-house attorneys. If I needed an accountant, we had in-house accountants. If I needed planners, we had planners. Uh, if you needed engineers, we had in-house engineers. All I had to do was pick up the phone and walk down the hall, and all of a sudden you had all of this expertise. We had all these senior-level staff members in those towns also. We had directors of planning, directors of public works, you know, we, you know police chief, fire chief, uh, accountants, uh, you know, directors of finance. So actually managing a town like Denton, Texas, or Odessa, Texas, in a way was easier than what I walked into because you were really managing. All you were doing was tying all those ends together. When I got down to the colony, all of a sudden I realized that Tom Hart was going to have to be the director of public works, the director of finance, the director of planning. So you had to get involved in all those areas, and there weren't experts there. 
So that was kind of the, the shock that I walked into, and uh, we started, and in retrospect, um, we coped. Now, having more experience and a few more years under my belt, I can see some items, that, some areas that uh, to do it over again, uh, you know, we might have done a little smoother, even a little better, but, but I think the group that we had right then, getting in and working together, I think we accomplished a lot. When I got there, the police department had gone through a uh, pretty good uproar. Uh, fortunately, I did not have to get involved in that. Uh, it was that was fairly well over. The only thing I had to do was uh, was to look for a new police chief. So that was the first major position that I got to hire while I was there. Uh, we went through a selection process, interviewed a number of people, uh, finally selected a gentleman named John Steinzik. John was a uh, sergeant on the DeSoto Police Force, but lived in the Colony, Texas, had uh, an advanced law enforcement certificate, was very, very heavy into training, uh, very active in the police associations, uh, was a very good man. So he became our police chief. So now we pack up to a three-man police department. The events, I guess the key events that occurred during my tenure there was uh, I started in May of 1978. My title initially was administrative assistant to the council. That's what I was hired in at. Within 30 days, that was really not a workable title because the, the job I immediately started fulfilling was more of a city administrator position. So about 30 days into my tenure, they did change my title. And I don't know if it was officially changed or if it was unofficially changed, but I became a city administrator because we were a uh, general law city at that point. Ms. Sandra Shearer, member of the First City Council of the Colony and currently president of the board of the Colony Municipal Utilities District. Any, any kind of places for a group to meet with any kind of civic uh, center of, of any kind at that time? No. There was the fire station. In order to meet in the fire station, you had to move all the fire equipment out. And there was nothing when I moved here. Stop and go open the week I moved here. That was in January '76, and that was the time. What are some of the some of the issues that you can recall that came before the council voted for certain? <laughs> well, I don't want several stick in my mind. One of them was the leash law. I wrote the ordinance. And uh, in the ordinance, you couldn't let your cats run free. <laughs> and Bill Longo, who had been a candidate for city council and lost, was not very happy. I remember he standing on a chair. We did make there was a church that opened up after, I guess, right about the time, city club, but I forgot about that. And we were meeting in the church at the time. He stood on a chair and said, it's not the nature of the beast. <laughs> and then we wanted to buy a, a building, a modular building that was used to use for City Hall because, like I said, there was nothing. It was stop and go, and I think there was a doctor's office next door to stop and go. And he had moved out. And after he moved out, we went to that building. Anyway, there was just no place to meet. And it was a very small office there, and it was good to stop and go. So I remember we... Went over off Preston Road somewhere to look at this thing. And we came back. We just thought it was the greatest idea. I think it was twelve thousand dollars. We thought it was a great buy. And uh, the citizens just raised the money because we were going to have to go in debt. I think it's probably one twelve. No, that's not twenty. Twenty twenty five thousand dollars. We were going to have to go in debt, and they didn't want to go in debt. They're sitting on. So we didn't buy it because they. Such ruckus. And then as we grew, people came to meetings all the time. I mean, people were involved in the community the first year. And we hired a police chief. And uh, one hot issue was when we fired the police chief. <laughs> he had made quite a few friends. And they didn't understand it. There's a lot of things. But those are really, in the car wash, 
this out like for a car wash. I like that was done quite how would she Ms. Kathy Bach, resident of the colony and a member of the Home Rule Study Committee and a member of the Colony Planning and Zoning Commission. Now we'd like to talk a little about the Home Rule Committee that you served on, uh, how it was formed, uh, how were the committee members selected, and some of the significant events that took place or significant topics of discussion that took place at the meetings. As I recall, I believe the members were selected by um, people, either volunteers or people who had been active in the community, being asked to serve on the committee by the, the mayor and city council. And as I recall, I'm not really sure that I remember exactly how they were selected, but I believe that's how. I think one of our main objectives was just to look at the difference between how it would um help or hurt the city to go from a general law city to a home rule and all the technicalities of doing that. I think our main objective was just to be sure that we were going into something better and and we just looked at the differences that it would matter such as elections and things like that. I think that was really our main objective and to lay some foundation for the Home Rule Charter Commission when they were um, established. Let's move on to discussing the uh, time of the Charter Commission and when that was being mm -hmm. written. Can mm -hmm. you talk to us about the political climate that existed there and what were some of the issues that the Charter Commission was having to deal with that were very politically alive in the community that mm -hmm. made their work perhaps a little more difficult? At that point in time, best of my recollection, there was, it was an era of uh, activity and, for lack of a better term, I think distrust. You know, people wanted to lock down the government by certain rules and uh, they didn't have a lot of trust in the government at all. And rightly so, probably at the time. Not not to anyone's discredit that served in that government, but just it was all so new. Mm -hmm. And you know, we, we uh, I think, elected the uh, Corporation Commission in August of 78. So, a year we had been struggling. And uh, I guess in those old days of forming a government, it just it brings out um, all sorts of people that um, that are first very intelligent and very active and want to be a part of that government. It brings out people that want to be able to uh, make something happen and for various reasons. It brings out a lot of power feelings mm -hmm. in people and. Uh, I've said to a lot of people that uh, before I came to work for the colony, I worked for a mortgage trust company, and we dealt with million-dollar interim construction projects. And there was less bickering over those million and multi-million-dollar projects than there were over an ordinance on dog of animal animal control leash law or something like that. Mm -hmm. Than there was on that. Uh, I don't know, it just brought out that um, that feeling in people that um, this is their, their time to make something happen. Mm -hmm. And what one person wanted to happen, another person didn't. And what one person thought was real important, another person didn't. And the priorities were just chaos cause, because we needed everything. Mm -hmm. And I think with that distrust and that prioritizing and disagreement on prioritizing what we need to do first. It was a very tumultuous climate. But we did decide we need to go charter. And of course then we had the election and we, we elected and we appointed, I believe, the mm -hmm. charter commission. And I got them going and they, I wasn't a party to mm -hmm. the commission and mm -hmm. I they did that separately. The right. government didn't interfere. Right. And then they had their meetings. 
and, and of course I've heard they had some hot meetings. <laughs> <laughs> Making decisions out of the, out of the dark, or the, 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 the most of the entire time. What, what you were doing was creating a city from yeah. the beginning, and, and uh, no one there had any idea what, what powers we had and what we were actually looking at. What, well, what, I, what we were giving. Yeah, them. I think I think I think for the first time, you know, from from the uh, uh, the citizens who formed the uh, Home Rule Committee and things like that, um, when we got in there. I think about the second, third, or fourth meeting, and we began to understand what kind of document we were creating and what we were doing. We, I think, I, it was like an awakening one night, late. <laughs> yeah, we had very late. Yes, very late. Very late. Very late. Very late. We, it dawned on us that we were building a city. These guys, the, that the, was the building the, this, the, this is a city that we were building. Now we'd always taken this this particular uh, mission uh, seriously and and Bob was always serious about dotting I's and crossing T's and and instead of B. You remember those discussions? Oh, afraid so. And but about the third of third right. or fourth meeting started it, impact, start, right? it, it impacted. That one word could change but the whole meeting. The whole meeting, the whole meeting right. or everything. That you had to go out and you had to make sure that everything was going to be there because what you were going to write you were either going to give these humongous privileges to people, or you were going to take them away from them. And they, granted, they could change over two years, and they did change some of them. But for the first two years, we were going to strap our city with what we decided. Well, that, I mean, from from ground all the way up to the, to the roof, we were building the thing, building it there. And each and one of those twelve members took it up on themselves. And fifteen. Fifteen. I'm sorry. Fifteen. We had a few that didn't work. Well, you know, you know, you know, you know, Twelve was more. I'm ten, ten, ten is more. Ten, like ten, ten, ten there all the time. Ten, well, ten is more like it. Like we had fifteen. But these guys took it seriously. Right, right. And then we began, um, more so Bob and, and some of the other guys, Chris, we would bring in documents from other cities and understand where they, we don't like this. We like this. This is wrong. This, this, is, my, yeah, this is my handwriting. <laughs> you know? Uh, and you don't keep them. After nepotism, well, no, we I'm were bringing all the stuff in. <laughs> we were bringing other charters in mm -hmm. and reading them. Mm -hmm. And our biggest thing that we had our hang up was that we had 12 weeks to do something that took most people a year to do. Year. Some yeah. of those were done in three years. Yeah. There were a couple of commissions where they would elect the commission, people would die from natural causes. <laughs> and before they'd, they'd have to have someone else re elected to the commission. And we had to get into this in within 12 weeks. We had to get it to go before print on, what was it, December the 15th? Mm -hmm. so yeah. Mm -hmm. so and then, what was the reason for that time deadline? Uh, they needed the election by a certain date. Well, there it were four, four times a year yeah. you can hold them, you can conduct an election in the state of Texas. And that was in January. That's and the January. next election was. January, otherwise we wouldn't have been held off until April. And we were running our meetings October from September to. And their concern was that this would be written prior to the, the new council election and so forth that were coming up. So that, 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 there, there was there was sense of urgency. Let's get this. There system. was always a sense of urgency in the colony. There still is. It did, don't know why. There still it is. needs to be done yesterday. And, and when we were holding the, this to show you how far we come was at. Where the meat market is now, besides stopping them. That was City Hall. That, that was, was City Hall. You know, and all of us were crammed into that, but it was good that we could go next door and get a soda on a break because some of the meetings would start at 7 30 and 12 or 1. You're still in meetings, though, right? Yeah. On the first stop. And there were other nights where we come in at 8 or 8 30 at night and we're still waiting to get that, that last person to have a forum. Mm -hmm. <laughs> How was Bob chosen as chairman? Uh, <laughs> certainly what By a telephone <laughs> call from this man from Chicago. We uh, had <laughs> the boat to well, yeah, here. Yeah. We had uh, Bob had the most votes on yeah. the uh, uh -huh. election which uh -huh. I mean, yeah. overall election right. 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 Yeah. Yeah. it was seven yeah. to seven between uh, me and another gentleman and he thing. dropped out basically <laughs> and he moved further on down and, the line. And uh, basically Bob is is a compromiser. Mm -hmm. uh, each person had a specific uh, uh, duty. Bob Brown here is a a stickler for detail. 
Uh, so are you. We like to shout that off, but so is he. <laughs> no, we, had, we really had two people, I think, that, that, that were that way, but in op opposite political type fields. And one was Bob Brown, and, Wes Gray. and the other was Wes Gray, who right, yeah. passed away a few Gray. years ago. And between Bob and Wes, the rest of us were kind of somewhere in the middle. And, we and so, be, and and I'm not saying whether Bob was right or left. Four or five other groups, and there were some other groups. As but, well. Bob, Bob, guys, but Bob, if you look at in the middle, had the, had the ability to transcend that whole spectrum yeah. of of where we were, and and he was sort of in the middle. He, you know, he could. Yeah, Bob was a good listener, mm -hmm. and he would listen to all sides and all perspectives. Oh, yes. and a good mediator as well. And so he was, you know, feel in the in the end, he was a very good choice. He was, oh, was, 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 was a guy that choice. brought it all together. Mm -hmm. they're, they're Without right. him, I thought I thought we'd have gotten through. That's a fact. I wow! <laughs> Thank you. <Dory. laughs> it took, it took eight years to get that out. <laughs> if, if you will recall, and there were two major political actions that really generated the sense of urgency in a lot of people's mind. Do you remember what those two were? The police chief. Firing of the firing police chief. Police chief. Okay. Uh, Bill Longo was the mayor and he refused to sign the budget. The budget. And the city had absolutely zero dollars. <laughs> and if Sorry, you want to believe this is happening while we're while we're meeting, meeting. While we're meeting. While we're meeting. Yeah, right. so this is prompting you oh, yes. to hurry. Oh, nothing so that nothing you ever went very simply. Well, January. the the Beltran incident occurred before. Yeah, it occurred it, a few months prior. All these okay. but that was still Let's very talk correct. about that incident. What was that incident, and why did it impact your decision to really push to get the, the charter? Finished. That's an excellent question. I've been dying for years to find out that. <laughs> yeah, I would like to know too. Why did well, that happen? Why? We had the chief of police in the colony. Um, I'm not going to criticize the man or build him up one way or the other. All I know is that quite a few people in the colony didn't like him as chief of police. Some of them were on the council, some of them were just plain citizens. We had quite a few people in the colony that did like him, and they backed him. Yeah. I was so, one of the ones that backed him. Right. Some of those people were on the council involved in other political groups, and it came to a showdown, I think, more between the two groups than anything else. Because my, my first thing The was, things that he was fired over were basically they were, rumor and... They were more personal, I think. Yeah. Personal you know, not, not something that it means... Not that he wasn't doing his job. job. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. these are things that... Well, I'm, I'm not going to get into what he was talking about. They were, they were very personal. There were, so it goes yeah. personal things. There were a lot of more at the end one of faction now. pushing another one, and it came down to who is the stronger faction, and neither faction won. He yep. was fired. The, the, the facts stronger of the matter have never been real. Out. Yeah. The facts of the matter have never come out. And probably never will, and, and probably and they never should not. No, because they're not. The uh, issue wasn't the, what happened. And, and, and it factualized happened, right, the fact that there wasn't a, an orderly progression of, of how to do things. Uh, okay, so really the issue then is over really more of a lack of a personnel policy? A policy. There, was no yeah, there was no guidelines. Yeah, there was no guidelines. Okay. Okay. Keep, keep the city has to have the everything is drawn out in the charter now and how everything progresses from that point on. Mm -hmm. And up to that point, we did that not have that. There was, there was nothing. We were a lawless that. city. When Longo <laughs> did, would not sign the budget, this city had no money to operate on whatsoever. That's correct. The, the, uh, the police act. chief was, was literally a wide open in his own right and uh, controlled his own operation. And the city council, uh, they were off in their own little corner and really had, although they, they hired him. Interesting. They, 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 had had no control. Control. they had no control. They, had no control. they, had, they didn't have the power well, of control that they have now well, in the charter. Well, that was one of the significant things about Jerry. Well, it's been kind of a misnomer that the, the police chief, Jim Beltran was his name, mm -hmm. was fired. Jim Beltran was not fired. Jim Beltran was given a vote of no confidence by the entire city council. And that was a very, very frightening time in my personal life and amongst other people. Unfortunately, what happened as a result of that is it became a power camp opposal, confrontation. And it left the realm of employer-employee confrontation. One thing, Jim was very good at using the press, and he would make innuendo very, very positively. 
And the council was not particularly adept at that. And plus, the council that hired him was not the council that fired him. Yeah. Quote, unquote. Mm -hmm. The unfortunate thing is that the whole affair polarized the community. Okay. And about 95% from my personal perspective, 95% of that polarization and the, and the quote unquote facts had nothing to do with what what the issue of dismissing the man was over. You said this was a frightening time. In what way? The vote of not the vote of no confidence. Huh? We had no law. There was no law both before and after. <coughs> we didn't know. We, it, you had to have been there to understand that. You had, was Jim going to go off the deep end? What was happening? No confidence. Right. So and then there was going to be a no. Yes. It's well, it's well, well, it's a long time building up. See, what you have to look mm -hmm. at is that you started out with a man that's hired by the city council, basically. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, um, I guess it's like creating a robot because this thing or person or position mm -hmm. starts to challenge what created it. Mm -hmm. more or less. And it was mm -hmm. happening in the newspapers, mm -hmm. in basic confrontations. The city would say they wanted it done this way and he'd do it the other way to prove how powerful he was mm -hmm. or what, how indispensable he was, might have been. I don't know. So and especially kind of, we're seeing a city council without any real control over the city. Is that... With no, with no policy and direction. They, okay. they, 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 okay. was that, that's there, there were two controlling factors, and each had their own power base mm -hmm. at that point in time. And, okay. and the people yeah. in, the, in many cases, I think a lot of people felt that the police chief had more power than the council. And I think yes. in, in some some situations, that the police chief may have felt things so. Keep in mind, there was also a law enforcement commission. That's what uh, West, West, West Gray was, 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 was on the uh, that was one of the major factions yeah. politically. Mm -hmm. No longer was it. Right. We go back to that. You remember on the, what we were talking about? About uh, we, you still had a police chief, but you had a, a commission set up. But what's that? Yeah, yeah. 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 we only had one of the officers. Well, Nick was one of the officers, right. and the other fellow was, he was a reservist. Uh, was a reservist, but he was a pay. Devil. No So when he left, the other police officer moved up. Well, but there was no, he was given no power. No, he was him. not when when Beltran left. Restagno was there, and and he was not raised or elevated to a chief's type status. Right. Of course, there were only one or two no. people. No, was there was also prior to that one, there was uh, another gentleman that was on the police force, and what sparked the entire thing was uh, uh, just a summary dismissal for no account of reason. By Beltran. And Beltran dismissed the other officer. The other officer. And uh, they were driving around in cars, police cars, totally unmarked, with no uniforms, carrying a, a, a gun gun on their head. <laughs> and, yeah. and if you challenged them, the gun came out. Why are <laughs> See, uh, and we're, my, first, my first encounter with the police here. Well, you was, got a problem with yeah. anyway. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> my first encounter with them was when I was moving in at night, and this uh, one car stopped me. They want to see which way. Want to see who I'm yeah, you know. And I'm saying I live here, and and my brother, thank goodness, was with me. He said, "Be glad that they are checking the house." And I said, "I don't know who that person was." <laughs> <laughs> but we we really no uniforms, no marked cars, but they had a pistol and and had a history of tra of trailing people at night. Okay. Okay, so these We're, are very real reasons for oh, yeah. oh, concern yeah. and, of the citizenry. Well, that's why this was so We're, much had to be done so quickly. Okay. Well, where it came to a head was when, during the dismissal, uh, there was a lot of, I mean, serious, strong emotion going on. And that's the only time that I have ever gone into a council meeting where the walls were lined by edict from Beltran to his reservists. Uh, in which they were carrying weapons. And I want to tell you, it's intimidating as hell when you walk into a council meeting as a <laughs> spectator and a man standing on the wall has got a 357 Magnum. <laughs> and he's on the opposite side. And he's on the opposite side from you. You might elaborate a little bit on the reservists, too, because that, our police force, we had, I think, two paid officers. And the rest were reserve officers. And many, many of which had absolutely no prior police training. 
Uh, they try. They they try to select people that have had so, so many military. Yes, so much military <laughs> training, so on and so forth. Were these citizens of the community? Oh, definitely yeah, so yeah. citizens and uh, the volunteers. All volunteers, no pay. no pay, and they'd come in and they'd have have some training courses and so on. But their basic training was in the field. They'd get in the car and ride with one of the officers and with a gun on the head. With a gun on the head. In fact, we ended up stopping that. Mm -hmm. uh, took their weapons away. Their weapons away. That, that was kind of a party. We talked about that. Yeah. Kind of a party fight situation. That, that was we a very sticky situation. Their, their right. Yeah, we yeah. talked about this in the home room too. Yeah. That was part of it. Uh, we got to the area of uniforms and and whether or not they should carry pistols at all. We really looked at different and model unique First, ways of, of personnel home. dismissal was the major issue. Okay, we that's tried. important. Uh, what did you do about it? That personnel. Gave it to one person. Okay. Gave everything to city to one person. And that person was the city manager. That's where the city manager came to us. But the fight on the well, you remember on the fight on the home rule was the makeup of the council. The council. How we yes. would make up the council. Was, was it gonna be city manager, mayor, or mayor, council? Yeah. And, strong week, man. And, and we were divided we're down the line way. on that. We for you're getting yeah, compromised, but we were divided down the line. It was compromised all the way. One of the biggest questions was whether or not the mayor would have a vote. Would have a vote and if he did have a vote, when would he vote? How would he vote? And why would he vote? And that's why we only wanted five council members yeah. because of the, uh, the time. There would be no tie. That goes back, be no goes back. back to that's where Dilla changed it and insisted to change it, which came about which because of zoning. Yeah. Okay. It goes back. That more really goes back to the, not to the issue of Beltran. No. It no. goes back to the issue of the mayor holding up a budget by not signing it. Okay, we didn't elaborate on that. Let's give a little background there. Um, on the budget. Want, uh -huh. On the budget issue. Under Vernon's annotated statute, the budget has to be signed or you go back to um, the previous, the previous year's, year's budget. budget and tax rate, which had zero money. Was there <laughs> Which and was when that was problem. refused to, I mean, it wasn't signed. Um, you just totally stopped the operation. That's it. You're out of business. Mm -hmm. You know, you can live here, but you're not a city. You, can, you know, you have nothing. It's hard to speak for someone else, but what was your impression of the reason for the mayor, whose name was Bill Longo at this time, his <clears throat> refusal to sign the budget? Uh, Anybody really? I don't know. Was it a recent tax rate increase or something? No, no, it, no, it was it a trouble. If it. Clint Davis, who was on the council, Gene Pollard, Gene Pollard. Mm -hmm. well, Longo, Pollard, and and Davis did not get along. Period. Paragraph, mm -hmm. as Gene was wont to say, complete opposites, total opposites, and no it came down where the meat market is at the stop and go was city council meeting. They had an afternoon budget session and had a break. Because Gene Pollard had to have a cigarette. Oh, yes. And they broke. Clint Davis and Bill Longo were enemies from way back. Had started out, one was the uh, campaign support original. Clint supported Longo. And he, they had a falling out. They went out on the porch and got into a shouting match. And it came down that I'll be damned if I'm going to sell, sign it, and you're then you're fixed forever, and you do it my way or I don't sign it. So it's a power struggle. Was Beltran was the first firing of the police chief, I and mean, uh, I remember that well because on my 20th wedding anniversary, I was sitting up at City Hall at four o'clock in the morning, and my wife was at home waiting for me to come home. But uh, I, I had some problems with the way the police department was operating uh, when we became a city under uh, Guerrero's leadership as mayor and that council that sat in office. I didn't like the unmarked cars. I didn't like the idea that a police officer was walking around in a sports jacket instead of a police uniform. And I felt it presented a threat to the citizens of the colony, especially a woman that might be speeding and being pulled over by an unmarked police car and an officer getting out of the police car and a sports coat instead of a police uniform that the woman might decide this is not a police officer and take off. 
And I've always felt that a police officer should be visibly seen in a marked car and in the uniform. So I didn't agree with the policy that the first city council started, what they call the soft approach to police work. Uh, I had some problems with Beltran before I was mayor. I felt he was a little too hard on the teenagers in the colony. And in fact, when I campaigned for mayor, I turned around and says two of the things I would try to correct if I was elected was to call the police chief in and talk to him and find out what's really going on. And the other problem was with the attorney of the city that we were paying money to, but never receiving an itemized bill. I just didn't like the idea of the city receiving a bill, but never being itemized of why this money was to be paid. That sounds like some major concern. <coughs> I understand that there was also a lot of attempts to raise taxes significantly. And could you tell us about some of, some of those and some of the heated arguments and discussions that were, went on because of that? When I was mayor in 78, 79, the tax rate was 15 cents per hundred dollars. Two members of the council wanted to drop the tax rate to 13 cents. The council was also talking about floating a bond issue. And I felt that 13 cents would not pay for the services that the citizens wanted. So I turned around and I vetoed the tax bill that the council had passed the budget because I felt that 13 cents was not sufficient to allow the city to provide the services. And that caused the problem. Everyone, our next contact here was giving the mayor the vote. And we want a, a and strong mayor, one that could sit up there and say, all right, if, if we come down there, it was a tie of vote or something like he could break it or he could vote all that, the time. That issue was never settled in the charter until right. our last Come week. On. Because we got down to the bottom. That was the last was item right. for us to address. Right. Right. What we did was we would always have that on the agenda to be discussed. But okay. I try and get four or five other items in first. And when it came up, if it was going to be long-winded and kept everything else, I, I had people on the charter that I asked them a favor. I'd go, Cliff, could you do me a favor? If it's going to be cut off and long, move to table it. Because we, we just didn't have time to spend... Mm -hmm. We spent more time on that one item yes. than on anything else. And I, but necessarily, the yes, first, no, first and so. simple chip. manifestation of Bob Howe's excellent ability at politics. He was somewhat of a Lago supporter at the time. And he did keep moving it out. And it would have been a slap at Longo had we done it quickly right after that. No, because uh, on that committee, we still had people who were for a strong man. Well, I don't agree with that at all. And I, 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 I don't I'll tell you what I did about no. it. Because I, I was a <laughs> long <longer> supporter. <laughs> no, I, I, don't, I wasn't a long supporter at that time. But I supported um, the strong mayor so concept I, coming out of Louisiana. There, there were a lot. Yeah, I did too. Yeah. Yeah, there were a lot of people that had areas. differing yeah, that on the issue. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, a lot of it goes. I, I really don't think it had, it had a, a lot to do with politics no. per se. No, it had to do with fear. Someone had, taking right. over. Uh, I can remember someone making the statement: "Do do we want a situation similar to what they have in Chicago, uh, where the right. mayor runs everything?" Right. You, you remember that? I mean, uh, you guys have changed. And you're still baiting. <laughs> And at the time, of course, Richard Daly was the mayor of Chicago, and he did have pretty strong control of the city. We were concerned uh, about giving that much power to one to one person, one individual. Of course, the big difference we had there was that he's a paid mayor and our mayor is not. That's right, that's and everybody missed that. That was the big difference, where he is a paid man, and that's his only job, where our mayor is, has his own job and does his mayor job on his that's own time. Yeah. But the mayor's influence would be strong, mm -hmm. and that's what we, I right. think, most tried to hold down. One and and got tore down by Dillard later. Yeah. One of the big things I'm hearing right this minute is your individual backgrounds and how they came into play here. Oh, definitely. Can you comment on that a little bit? Well, Everybody came from different parts of the country. I came from Cincinnati, mm -hmm. and we had a very good mayor in Cincinnati for years, and. Uh, my father was in politics when I was a uh, youngster, and uh, my dad knew the mayor, so I ended up being with the mayor a lot and went to a lot of meetings. 
And uh, I saw what that mayor did to Cincinnati. Of course, here was another paid mayor. But I felt very strongly about that when I came down here and we were talking about the mayor. And I knew what kind of a mayor that, that I wanted to run the city. Even if he was not a paid mayor, you still want that guy to have the integrity and the leadership ability to pull the city together and still go forward. And I think we all felt that way coming from different parts of the country. Okay. Uh, can you comment on your background and how it impacted well, I came from the uh, We had a mayor in just about four towns from what I did before I moved down here. The mayor was convicted for graft uh, and corruption. He, uh, he had a job on the side. He was a mayor, but he had a job that paid about $10,000 a year. When the IRS finally ordered him, he had about $8.5 million worth of assets. And part of his dealings were that, as a mayor, he was a very strong personality and controlled everything away. And if you wanted to put a shopping center in, well, you'd build him a little building or give him a little piece of land and he'd get it through. But they had the lowest tax rate. They had the best parks. They had the best roads. I mean, when he got a little piece for himself, he got a lot for the community out of whatever he did under the table, I guess you'd call it. And uh, it always stuck in my mind, the man was convicted went to jail, was released about 11 months later, served 11 months, stayed off for about two years, I think that was part of his deal, and uh, was nobody even ran against him when he ran for mayor the following time. He ran unopposed, and I mean, got a landslide of people coming out to vote for a mayor that was unopposed. The people loved him. He was an extremely strong personality, and as such, I saw a strong mayor as something positive for the city. Mm -hmm. Because if your main leader that you look at, the mayor, is a weak personality, you have a lot of in-house fighting. Not that you want to rubber stamp, you know, everybody saying yes, 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 because Cliff's the mayor and he said, that's the way you're going to go. But you want people that are going to look at it, and if that man's going in the right direction, be mm -hmm. strong enough to be quiet and let it go through rather than fight just for publicity. And I was in favor of this real strong man. And then you had people from down south and other areas of the country that were in favor of a, a strong council because they could hold this man in check. Who was one of those individuals? Which you can speak from that viewpoint. Any of you that are here? I'm the, for the strong council position. I was in favor of the mayor president kind of uh, position because coming out of yeah, yeah, because coming out of bad rooms. Coming back, we had a